Welcome to the University of Kentucky YouTube channel. We're covering anesthesia keywords, specifically the 2018 keywords on multiple topics. Toxicity, temperature, ENT, eye, aging, psychiatric, orthopedic, and fluids as they relate to anesthesia. This is part of the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology Didactics and preparation for the in-training exam. If you desire, you can go to our YouTube channel and there are video casts with comprehensive keyword reviews up through 2017, but do not include 2018, which we are covering in this video cast. Temperature and toxicity are combined into one, aging and psychiatric into another, and ortho and fluids into another, and their links are here. Let's start reading on temperature and toxicity. The keywords from 2018 are in green. The ones in black are over the last decade or so on this topic. In 2018, nerve gas, the treatment of such, malignant hyperthermia and the presenting signs, heat loss prevention, and multiple sclerosis exacerbation of symptoms. And the reason why it's under temperature is because an increase in perioperative temperature of even a degree or so can cause an exacerbation of multiple sclerosis. Nerve toxins and nerve gases. Nerve gases treatment was the key word. First of all, botulism toxin and tetanus toxin as a background work presynaptically to block the exocytosis of acetylcholine. And in the case of botulism toxin, it results in muscle weakness or paralysis. In the case of tetanus toxin, it can result in muscle spasm because there's blockade of inhibitory neurons. Nerve gases, however, work at the post-junctional acetylcholinesterase enzyme. That acetylcholinesterase enzyme, when it's inhibited by nerve gases such as sarin or organophosphate insecticides, such as a farmer being exposed to it, can result in increased acetylcholine. The acetylcholinesterase enzyme is blocked. It doesn't break down acetylcholine. Acetylcholine builds up and when it activates the muscarinic receptor, it results in bradycardia, bronchoconstrictions, small pupils, urination, emesis, increased bowel activity, and when it builds up a lot at the nicotinic receptor, it can overactivate it, kind of like succinylcholine does, and result in muscle paralysis. The treatment for nerve gas uh, toxicity is atropine. It blocks the muscarinic uh, side effects of the nerve gas, Prelidoxime, although controversial, has been used in the past in an attempt to reactivate the enzyme acetylcholinesterase by removing the organophosphate compound. Pritostigmine can be taken prophylactically by people who anticipate being exposed to a nerve agent because it's a reversible as opposed to an irreversible cholinesterase inhibitor. And if it sits on that enzyme, uh, it can prevent the irreversible inhibitor from binding to it and it has a prophylactic beneficial effect. The next topic is malignant hyperthermia presenting signs. That was the key word in 2018 as a background. Uh, the triggers of malignant hyperthermia in a genetically susceptible individual uh, is volatile agents and or succinylcholine. One, the other, or in combination. Most of our other drugs are not triggers. Things like propofol, automidate, midazolam, ketamine, opiates, dropyridol, nitrous oxide, uh, rocuronium, and local anesthetics. There is an association uh, of malignant hyperthermia with several musculoskeletal diseases including central core disease and King-Denborough syndrome. Duchenne's and other muscular dystrophies uh, association with MH has been brought into question recently and is controversial. The presentation of malignant hyperthermia is the key word, and early on, as the calcium builds up inside that muscle cell, there is cross-linking of the tropoponin, tropomyosin fibrils, and you get muscle rigidity. And this muscle rigidity occurs even in the presence of neuromuscular blockade, like with rocuronium on board. Rocuronium works at the neuromuscular junction. The problem is in the muscle itself, and the muscles become rigid even with rocuronium uh, administered. Tachycardia, hypercarbia, CO2 starts to build up as the muscles contract and produce CO2. They also produce acid, they use oxygen, and the temperature eventually goes up 
and that is a late finding. The patient, if they're breathing spontaneously, such as through an LMA, um, they will start to breathe faster as the CO2 builds up with a higher minute ventilation. Obviously, if there's a neuromuscular blocker on board and they're intubated, you will not see this tachypnea, but a rise in end tidal CO2. Again, the late finding is a rise in temperature, the acidosis, a decreased mixed venous oxygen because your tissues are using oxygen and it comes back instead of at 70% or so, it comes back at less than 50%. Cyanosis and modeling and potassium can be released resulting in uh, hyperkalemia with peak T waves and muscles can break down and release myoglobin and the urine can turn brown. All of this uh, potassium and other changes in pH can result in dysrhythmias uh, and the presenting signs therefore malignant hyperthermia are early signs like muscle rigidity and late signs like a rise in temperature. The next key word is heat loss prevention and let's first look at the mechanisms of heat loss which include radiation which is losing heat from your body to like the walls of the room and one way to prevent that is keep the room warm convective heat loss which is like air blowing over top of you conductive heat loss if you're lying against a cold surface such as a, a bed evaporative heat loss now the rate of development of hypothermia is shown at the right graphically with the change in core temperature on the y-axis and elapsed time on the x-axis and you can see in the first 30 to 60 minutes or so of an anesthetic there is a rapid drop in temperature and that initial heat loss of about one to one and a half degrees centigrade that occurs within that first hour is the result of anesthesia induced vasodilation and mixing of the cold blood that's in your extremities for example with the warm blood that is in the core of your body and when they uh, mix this is called a redistribution of heat it's not like you're losing heat per se it's just mixing a cold part of your body with your warm part of your body and um, the patient's temperature drops that one to one and a half degree because of redistribution of heat now the way to potentially uh, prevent that is warm the patient preoperatively with a forced air warmer get their extremities warm and such that when they're exposed to a general anesthetic and vasodilate their blood coming back from their extremities will be warmer. When they're in the operating room, a way to prevent heat loss is warm the operating room such that radiant heat loss is reduced. And one of the best ways to warm a patient is forced air warming. And that's a way to reduce shivering. Another way to reduce shivering is low doses of IV Demerol or Meperidine. The next uh, topic is heat loss prevention and this is a continuation of the slide before but showing the mechanisms of heat conservation which are one when you're cold your body causes vasoconstriction an attempt to reduce the loss of heat and this is impaired under general anesthesia as well as under neuraxial anesthesia we don't not only vasoconstrict to reduce heat loss but also shiver to generate uh, heat and this is our skeletal muscle doing this. However, if we have neuromuscular blockade on board, rocuronium for example, obviously you can't shiver and this is impaired or absent under general anesthesia. So vasoconstriction and shivering, two mechanisms in an attempt to preserve heat. If you look at the graphics on the far right, you can see in green the shivering threshold, in red the vasoconstriction threshold, and in blue the sweating threshold. And you can see that desflurane uh, greatly decreases this threshold. And as the concentration of desflurane goes up towards 1 mac, 6%, you can see that the shivering threshold is uh, greatly decreased. So it takes a larger drop in temperature for you to start shivering, and your vasoconstrictive threshold is reduced. So under desflurane anesthesia at 1 mac, you're not going to vasoconstrict as much, and you're not going to shiver as much. And you can see that alfentanil opioids don't have as much effect. Dexmedetomidine has a little bit of effect like that, but not as much as desflurane. And then you have uh, propofol also having that vasodilatory effect and a reduction in the shivering and constriction threshold. So prevention and treatment of hypothermia, warm the room to 23 degrees. Obviously, that's very uncomfortable. We can't do that in every room, but this would decrease radiant heat loss. And the most effective method to warm a patient 
is forced air warming, not putting a warming mattress on him, not using him at event, not warming the IV fluids. This is not great ways of warming a patient. A forced air warmer is the best. Multiple sclerosis and exacerbation of symptoms is the next keyword from 2018. MS is an inflammation and demyelination of not peripheral nerves, but the central nervous system, and it's treated with immunosuppressive drugs, corticosteroids, and some other special drugs like interferon. In the perioperative period, in a patient with multiple sclerosis, you want to avoid any even slight increase in temperature because as little as one degree centigrade can cause an exacerbation of MS. So hyperthermia is the thing that exacerbates MS, not uh, hypothermia per se. GA is usually uh, supplied uh, as the choice of anesthetic in a patient with multiple sclerosis. There is some problems with a subarachnoid block, putting a local anesthetic and exposing those demyelinated nerves to high concentrations of local anesthetic uh, may exacerbate MS. So SAB tends to be avoided. Epidural or peripheral nerve block is acceptable. We avoid succinylcholine because multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disease. And if you have demyelinization and um, nerves that are not working well, and you expose extra junctional receptors to succinylcholine, you can get a hyperkalemic response. If someone's on high doses of steroids, you consider steroid supplementation in the perioperative period. Patients with multiple sclerosis, if their nerves aren't working very well, very well, they can have respiratory dysfunction. They can have weakness of those respiratory muscles and their breathing muscles, their minute ventilation, their force vital capacity, expiratory weakness occurs, and they're at risk for aspiration and pneumonia in the perioperative period. But the major point of this keyword was that hyperthermia, even small increases in temperature, can exacerbate multiple sclerosis. The next group of keywords from 2018 are ENT and I topics. Again, they are in green. The black uh, represents about a decade of keywords. The times three, times four, times two, etc. refer to how many times that keyword has shown up over the last decade or so. But we're focusing on the 2018 ones in green. Laser airway fire, thyroidectomy complications, jet ventilation complications, and then under I, We'll talk about postoperative blindness and the cause of it, ocular cardiac reflex, and retinal detachment, and sulfur hexafluoride. Laser airway fire, the first key word from 2018, ENT topic. How do we decrease the risk of laser-generated airway fires? There's three things that we can do. One, if there's an endotracheal tube in place, reduce the flammability of that endotracheal tube. Use a steel one, for example, and the example at the top right is a steel tube, one with a cuff, uh, a double cuff actually, and one with no cuff. These stainless steel uh, endotracheal tubes are the most resistant to uh, lasers. The PVC tubes are very flammable, as are uh, red rubber and silicon endotracheal tubes. So a stainless steel tube most resistant to the laser uh, and resulting in a reduced risk of fire. You can put um, saline in the uh, cuff. You can put methylene blue in the cuff of these tubes so that if the laser happens to strike the cuff and it uh, deflates, the methylene blue is spilled into the airway and you see blue in the airway and you can say, aha, my cuff is broken. Um, another way to reduce laser generated airway fire is to reduce the available FIL2. Usually we make it less than 30 percent, a mix of uh, air and oxygen with overall FIL2 less than 30 percent. We avoid nitrous because it also can support combustion. Another way to reduce laser fire is remove the flammable material from the airway. So don't even have something there that the laser could hit and that would include intermittent ventilation or having a small endotracheal tube that's placed in, you ventilate, then remove it, and apnea occurs, and the ENT surgeon lasers during the apneic period, waiting for the saturation to fall. The saturation starts to fall, the tube is put back in, and ventilation occurs again. So stainless steel tube, keep the FO2 less than 30%, and uh, if possible, not even have an endotracheal tube in the airway during the time of the laser. 
Now, if an airway fire occurs, according to the ASA Practice Advisory 2013, the very first thing that you should do without waiting is if there's, that tube is on fire, pull the endotracheal tube, number one. Then stop the flow of all airway gases, flood the surgical field with saline, uh, ventilate the patient by mask initially, and then uh, reintubate them, and consider bronchoscopy if there's pieces of endotracheal tube uh, or you need to investigate for a burnt airway. Thyroidectomy complications is the next keyword from 2018. There are three things that we're going to discuss. Nerve damage, parathyroid injury, and bleeding into the neck. First, nerve damage. Superior laryngeal nerve has both an external and an internal branch. The internal branch is a sensory branch to the area above the vocal cords. The external branch innervates the uh, cricothyroid muscle. It's the only muscle supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve. The recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies all the other muscles of the larynx. But that little cricothyroid muscle is a tensor of the vocal cords. So if you damage the superior laryngeal nerve, you've damaged the ability to tense your vocal cords and you end up with a whispery voice. So damage to the superior laryngeal nerve, whispery voice, because of loss of innervation to the cricothyroid muscle. Now the recurrent laryngeal nerve is a real problem if you injure it because you lose the ability to uh, pull those vocal cords apart but you have intact abil ability for them to stay together because the cricothyroid muscle is still intact. So the cords end up in a paramedian position and you can have possible total airway obstruction requiring a tracheostomy. One way to attempt to re reduce the incidence of uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is use monitoring of EMG and uh, here at the University of Kentucky we use NIMS tubes at the far right, with the blue arrow pointing to it, is a NIMS tube, and you can see the little metal portion, which I'm pointing to now, just above the cuff of the endotracheal tube, and the little wires coming out of it. When you place this endotracheal tube, we usually intubate with either no neuromuscular blocker or succinylcholine, because the succinylcholine will wear off rapidly, because this tube is actually positioned with that metal portion between the vocal cords. You need those vocal cords to be innervated and be able to constrict and contract if the nerve is being uh, irritated in any way as the ENT surgeon is working. So you don't put uh, lidocaine gel, for example, on your endotracheal tube. Don't use long-acting neuromuscular blocker like rocuronium. And uh, we tend to use the biggest tube we can so that the contact of that metal occurs with the vocal cords. Parathyroid injury can occur, the little parathyroids sit in the back side of the thyroid usually and uh, can be sometimes inadvertently removed and if too much of the parathyroid tissue is removed, acute hypocalcemia can occur. Now it often occurs in about uh, one to two days after thyroid surgery, so not right after thyroid surgery, but one to two days afterwards in a small percentage of patients. If a patient who has had thyroid surgery suddenly starts to develop things like tingling around their mouth and their fingertips, and if you blow up a blood pressure cuff on their arm, their hand contracts, and if you tap on the side of their uh, uh, eye, uh, right around their forehead area, they can get facial contracture when you're tapping on that seventh cranial nerve, Schaafstex sign. Their calcium is low and the QT interval can be prolonged. So the problem is the parathyroid has been injured so much that calcium levels go down and so the treatment is intravenous calcium. Airway management may be necessary if laryngeal stridor or spasm results uh, because of the hypocalcemia. The third thing that can occur with thyroidectomy is a neck hematoma and bleeding into the neck uh, is a emergency. Oftentimes it's noticed in the recovery room and the patient may require opening of the incision, opening of the muscle, letting the blood come out, the airway to be uh, back into a midline position. Do not put these patients to sleep. Do not paralyze them if at all possible. Keep an ENT surgeon in the room with you and awake intubation may be necessary. Uh, the airway may be impossible to intubate if there's a huge hematoma.
uh, uh, pushing the airway uh, to the side or uh, constricting it. The next key word is jet ventilation complications. And the picture up at the top right is the example of a jet ventilator. There's other forms of jet ventilation. The picture at the bottom shows a cricothyroid catheter having been placed, that little catheter being attached to a manual trigger, uh, attached to an oxygen outlet. And as you depress that manual trigger, um, the pressure from the oxygen outlet up to 50 PSI usually is adjustable. You start very low at 5 or so and go up and jet ventilation occurs through that catheter and through the venturi effect a train entrains air there is also a high frequency jet ventilator shown here at the bottom far right and uh, all of those are forms of jet ventilation we use jet ventilation for rigid bronchoscopy airway surgery after catheter cricothyroidotomy and the types again are the high frequency jet there's the low frequency manually triggered um, like the cricothyroid catheter, but the key word was the complications of the use of these. Now you can see that this little catheter is pretty small and blasting oxygen in there you can oxygenate pretty well, but over time the CO2 builds up and hypoventilation occurs. And so jet ventilation is usually limited not so much by oxygenization but by adequacy of ventilation and the buildup of CO2 that occurs. Now if you have total apnea, the CO2 tends to build up about six millimeters of mercury the first minute and about three to four millimeters of mercury each minute thereafter. If there's an increased uh, PaCO2 from the hypoventilation, uh, you can have cardiac dysrhythmias and you can have respiratory acidosis occur. Another complication of jet ventilation other than just hypoventilation, is the risk of barotrauma. Although this is relatively rare, you can have air that gets blasted into the pneumo, into the mediastinum, into the um, uh, thorax, and you can get a pneumomediastinum or a pneumothorax, or both for that matter. You need to give time for the air to come back out. And if you have jetting under high pressure gases coming into the airway, in inadequate expiratory time, you could see how the pressures could build up and pneumomediastinum, crepitus in the uh, neck, and pneumothorax with collapse of both lungs could occur. The next key word is perioperative blindness etiology, but let's first touch on postoperative ocular complications to put it into context. If a patient wakes up in the recovery room, with unilateral eye pain and tearing and if the lights are on it really bothers them, photophobia, and if they blink it really hurts. Uh, the picture at the top right is a fluorescein stained eye and you can see the scratch in that cornea. Very painful, usually unilateral, um, lots of uh, tearing. Now another thing that can happen is central retinal artery occlusion and if a patient is prone with a lots of pressure on their eyeball they can get this proptosis postoperatively, chemosis, hyphemia, lid bruising with pale edematous retina, and cherry red spot is the classic finding, often occurring, um, not often occurring, but associated with head and neck surgery. So central retinal artery occlusion, lots of pressure on the eyeball from being prone, and the picture at the bottom right is that cherry red spot characteristic of central retinal artery occlusion. Now, cortical blindness refers to the occipital uh, lobe of the brain being damaged, often uh, after coronary artery bypass graft surgery that has been complicated by severe hypotension and low flows. So bilateral blindness, they wake up blind. Uh, that occipital lobe is a watershed area, and because of the extended periods of low flow hypotension, they can wake up uh, with cortical blindness. They have a normal optic disc and pupillary response. Acute angle closure glaucoma, for example, would be a patient who, who you know has glaucoma. Maybe you didn't know it was angle closure glaucoma. And in the perioperative period, you gave them scopolamine, for example, a patch, or atropine. And you, that midriatic drug causes their pupil to get big and makes the iris fold back like a curtain on the peripheral edges of the eyeball and block the canella schlem outflow of the fluid in the eye and the pressure builds up dramatically and in the recovery room 
they can have an eyeball that looks dead in appearance. Blurred vision, you've used a midriatic drug, dead eyeball appearance, think acute angle closure glaucoma. Now let's go to our key word of the causes of perioperative blindness. One of the major causes of blindness is ischemic optic neuropathy. It's a painless visual loss, can be on one side or both sides, uh, frequently associated with spine surgery. It can be the anterior or the posterior variant. Now, ischemia to the optic nerve, if it's anterior, uh, which is the most common, the optic disc can be edematous, and the picture at the far right with the blue arrow pointing to it is an example of a pale optic disc edema with adjacent retina infarcted, and that white, pale, swollen, and hyperemic optic disc, and that's apparently the appearance, although I likely could not pick that up, of anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Posterior ischemic optic neuropathy is behind the retina, so you don't see it, and the optic disc will appear normal. But ION in general, uh, number one cause of perioperative bl blindness, often after spine or prone surgery. So the risk factors, proning, spine procedures, GA of long duration in these spine procedures, large blood loss, male sex, obesity, and the recommendations from the ASA practice advisory include to mix some colloids in with your crystalloids instead of just pouring in a bunch of crystalloids when you are attempting to maintain intravascular volume. There's no specific transfusion threshold, like a hemoglobin of eight, nine, or 10, but Obviously, a very low hemoglobin would be associated with potentially low uh, delivery of oxygen into that uh, optic nerve. Keep the head in the neutral position with the head not down below the heart. Oculocardiac reflex is the next key word and involves cranial nerve 5 and 10, trigeminal vagal. And the picture at the top right shows the eyeball with the uh, extraocular muscles around it when those extraocular muscles have traction applied to them, like the medial rectus muscle, manipulation of the globe with a retrobulbar block, for example, pressure on the eyeball, or even an increase in intraocular pressure can trigger this ocular cardiac reflex. And again, in the figure at the top right, you can see um, the um, ciliary ganglion, uh, the geniculate ganglion, the trigeminal nerve, taking the signal to the brainstem, and then from the brainstem through cranial nerve number 10 back to the heart, slowing the heart, resulting in bradycardia. So the afferent limb is the fifth cranial nerve trigeminal to the brainstem, while the efferent limb is the tenth cranial nerve vagus to the heart. Brady dysrhythmias and hypotension, even asystole, can occur, and it tends to be aggravated by light anesthesia if there's concomitant hypoxia and or hypercarbia. This fatigues really easily, so if you keep pulling on the eye muscle, tends to go away or at least be reduced over time. It's not necessarily prevented by giving prophylactic atropine or glycopyrrolate before the operation, but treat it when it occurs and when it's associated with hypotension. Treat it with atropine intravenously or just tell the surgeon, stop pulling on the eyeball, remove the stimulus, deepen the anesthesia, atropine as we mentioned before, and local anesthetic infiltration of the extraocular muscles can reduce this afferent efferent oculocardiac reflex of trigeminal vagal. The next key word is retinal detachment gas bubble under uh, eye pharmacology. It's under that eye pharmacology because nitrous oxide expands sulfur hexafluoride gas bubbles that are used often during retinal detachment surgery. At the end of retinal detachment surgery, that sulfur hexafluoride bubble can be put in the back of the eyeball to help hold the retina in place. If a patient with a sulfur hexafluoride bubble is exposed to nitrous oxide, that bubble will expand. And you can imagine what would happen if you have that bubble in the back of your eye, it expands uh, greatly, intraocular pressure could go up. And we say avoid nitrous oxide for about four to six weeks after sulfur hexafluoride use. Some other things to think about regarding eye pharmacology and our anesthetic agents. Intravenous as well as inhaled agents decrease intraocular pressure. So pretty much everything that we give decreases intraocular pressure except succinylcholine and ketamine. Ketamine can cause nystagmus and blepharospasm and can actually increase the intraocular pressure. The next group of keywords are related to aging physiology and pharmacology.
And uh, in 2018, the green ones uh, were present. Aging, volatile anesthetics, and EEG changes. Pulmonary physiologic changes. And uh, the pharmacokinetics of the barbiturate thiopental. In black represents the key words over the last decade or so on the topic of aging. And you can see that cardiovascular physiology, autonomic and central nervous system physiology, respiratory physiology, and pharmacology are the major categories. But we're going to focus in on the green keywords from 2018. The first is volatile anesthetics in the EEG, and we'll put it under the category of aging in the central nervous system. As a background, the aged patient has autonomic dysfunction. Their baroreceptors don't function very well, and you could have instability of blood pressure and temperature regulation issues perioperatively. When an old person gets out of bed in the morning, they get out of bed very slowly because if they stood up rapidly, their baroreceptors don't kick in as fast, and they could uh, actually faint. So autonomic dysfunction. Their brain mass actually goes down, and if they have less cells, their cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen goes down. And if they don't need as much oxygen, their cerebral blood flow, which is auto-regulated with cerebral metabolism, also goes down. So cerebral blood flow and metabolism both go down as the brain mass decreases. But auto-regulation is intact to both pressure, so there's that flat portion of the auto-regulatory curve between cerebral perfusion pressure of 60 to 160, unless they've had long-standing hypertension, which can shift that auto-regulatory curve to the right. Neurotransmitters are decreased, serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine. And because of this, as, other, as well as other reasons, there's an increased sensitivity to many of our anesthetics. And MAC decreases about 6% per decade after age 40. Getting finally to our key word of volatile anesthetics and the EEG, there is a greater decrease in EEG power amplitude and frequency for equal dose volatile anesthetic compared with a younger person, which means basically if you had someone at one MAC desflurane, about 6%, who was 20 years old versus 6% uh, of an 80-year-old, the EEG in the young person would have greater uh, power, higher frequency, than would the older uh, patient. CNS aging, continuing on this topic, there's decreased pain perception. Opioids are reduced by 50% because not only are they pharmacodynamically more sensitive, but they also have some decreased pain perception. So pretty much all of our opioids, we reduce the dose in about half. They have impaired thermal regulation, inability to constrict their blood vessels as well and preserve heat. And so temperatures can be more variable in the perioperative period. And they can also have a risk of hyperthermia because they don't sweat as much and their threshold for sweating is actually at a higher temperature. Neuraxial blocks are some changes. Epidural, there tends to be a spread more of the local anesthetic and you can get a larger dermatomal spread for the same volume of local that you put in the epidural space. And it, subarachnoid blocks tend to last a little bit longer in the aged patient. The next key word is pulmonary changes with aging. The lung of an elderly patient is like an emphysematous patient in some ways in that it loses its elastic recoil. It's like a balloon that doesn't want to uh, go back to a small size when you blow it up. It becomes uh, like floppy, floppy. So the lung is very compliant and it is at higher volumes. The functional residual capacity is actually higher. And let's look at the graphic on the bottom right to see what happens with age on the x-axis and lung volume on the y-axis. And you can see that FRC is getting bigger as we age. You can see that residual volume, which is air trapped in the lung, that we cannot, even with our best effort, get that air out. And uh, both Residual volume and FRC go up, but closing volume also goes up, and it crosses FRC at a pretty young age, mid-60s or so, and which means that your tidal volume breathing, uh, as you get to 60s and above, some of that tidal volume breathing is actually occurring at the closing volume, so there's VQ mismatch, and oxygen in your blood goes down because of that VQ mismatch. So you have a lung that's very compliant with large FRC and trapped air in it, 
You lose alveolar units, just like an emphysematous patient, so DLCO goes down. And if you measure an arterial blood gas in an elderly, place, elderly patient, it's decreased. There's an equation that you can use to estimate it that says 109 minus 0.4 times your age would give you the approximate PaO2 for just normal aging effect on oxygen in our blood. There's also maybe a left shift in the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve which decreases the P50, normal P50 being 27, so this would be a slight shift away from 27 towards lower uh, level like 25-ish or so, although this is debatable. That small airway closure and gas trapping and increased residual volume that we talked about and there is decreased expiratory flow rates. So we can summarize some of the effects of the aging in the respiratory system in the lung itself with VQ mismatch and decrease in arterial oxygen and emphysematous like changes with a very compliant lung with gas trapped in it. Ventilatory control, the elderly patients not nearly as responsive to hypoxia or hypercarbia where they should respond with hyperventilation when that occurs. The chest wall tends to be less compliant. We said their lung itself was compliant but the chest wall might be stiff because of arthritic changes, cartilaginous changes, and their muscles are not as strong, and so the bellows, the ability to move air in and out, not so great. Conducting airways, not a lot of change. Airway reflexes tend to be depressed, and it's not uncommon to do direct laryngoscopy in an elderly patient, see particles of food around their uh, uh, glottic opening or glottic structures and go, how can they tolerate that? And when you realize that their airway reflexes are decreased, then it makes more sense. Pharmacodynamics versus pharmacokinetics in the elderly. There are many drugs that the elderly have increased cerebral sensitivity to. Propofol, opioids, midazolam, our volatile anesthetics, the MAC decreases 6% per decade after age 40. There is no increased cerebral sensitivity to uh, neuromuscular blocking agents, that is, there is no sensitivity to neuromuscular blocking agents, and there's no cerebral sensitivity to automidate or barbiturates. So let's put aside neuromuscular blocking agents, which we don't need to change the dose per se in the elderly patient because there's no pharmacodynamic increased sensitivity. Um, and at the brain, the barbiturates and automidate, there is no increased cerebral sensitivity but you still reduce the dose. In the case of the barbiturates, the reason why you decrease the dose, not because their brain's more sensitive, but because of pharmacokinetic reasons. And there's a decreased central volume of distribution. And to me, I like to think of it as the barbiturate goes into the brain and just doesn't come out as fast from the brain. Um, and we reduce the dose because of that. A pharmacokinetic reason for reducing the dose. The next group of keywords is psychiatric topics and anesthesia. Again, over the last about eight to ten years or so, there's some uh, key words here and in green are the ones from 2018. ECT and cardiac effects, ECT and drug selection, denepazil and anesthetic interactions, and lithium and some anesthetic interactions. So let's look at those 2018 keywords. The first one being ECT's effect uh, physiologically on the cardiac system. Cardiovascular effects, initially when the ECT fires and a seizure starts to occur in the brain, there's initial parasympathetic stimulation. The patient often becomes bradycardiac and the blood pressure can decrease, but this is very temporary. If you wanted to block that, glycopyrrolate could be given before the ECT prophylactically. Immediately after the parasympathetic stimulation with bradycardia occurs, sympathetic stimulation with tachycardia, hypertension, increased heart oxygen requirements, and dysrhythmias can occur. If you want to block that hypertension and tachycardia, Esmol is pretty good. Nitroglycerin can be used. Uh, Remifentanil can be used as part of your anesthetic drugs uh, to block the sympathetic stimulation that is the secondary component, the cardiovascular effects of ECT. On a side note, what happens in the brain with ECT is the brain is seizing, it uses more oxygen and therefore blood flow goes up to the head and ICP can actually go up and so you're not going to do electroconvulsive therapy in those with uh, pre-existing increased intracranial pressure. Other things that the ECT does, it raises intraocular pressure, 
and can also raise intragastric pressure. Drug selection for ECT is the next keyword from 2018. Classic pharmacologic management in the past included maybe glycopyrrolate for patients who uh, would get very bradycardic with their previous ECTs. Brevitol or methylhexatol uh, was the gold standard for a long time because propofol actually shortens the seizure duration with the ECT and you want the patient to seize. They need to seize for a certain period of time for it to have its beneficial effects, usually on a very bad um, depression. Now, propofol, if you use it, don't put lidocaine with it because lidocaine reduces the seizure as does the propofol itself and you may not get much of a seizure. We use a neuromuscular blocking agent, using usually succinylcholine in a reduced dose because ECT only lasts for a very short period of time and you want the patient to return to spontaneous ventilation pretty quickly. So low dose succinylcholine to avoid some of the effects of what would happen if the muscles in the body all contracted. There could potentially be fractures of long bones, for example. Esmol may be added to blunt the sympathetic response and then mass ventilation is usually performed during the paralysis uh, that's typical um, to do mass ventilation and not put an endotracheal tube down these patients unless they're at a big risk for aspiration. And then you can do your induction agent succinylcholine tube, but you're going to do ECTs a lot of times and usually they're done with mass ventilation without an endotracheal tube. Now the seizure duration is important. Things that shorten it we want to avoid. So propofol, not a great choice for uh, uh, induction in a patient for ECT, or if you use it, use it in low doses. Midazolam we use to treat seizures. It's going to reduce the seizure duration. And lidocaine, if we combined it with propofol or used it in an attempt to try to block the sympathetic stimulation from the ECT, it would shorten the seizure duration. Uh, Brevitol, ketamine, remifentanil, esmolol, labetalol, dexmedetomidine have no effect on the seizure duration. And if you want to increase the seizure duration, etomidate could be chosen as an induction agent, and caffeine can be given prophylactically before ECT to increase the seizure duration. Now, hyperventilation can uh, increase the seizure duration. Uh, opioids, if we use a little bit of remifentanil and then decrease our dose of induction agent, for example, if you happen to be using propofol, combined it with a little remi so that you could reduce your propofol dose, then your uh, seizure could be of longer duration and the remifentanil could be used to decrease the sympathetic response that occurs with uh, uh, the secondary component of the classic physiologic response to ECT of cardiovascular stimulation. Again, lidocaine uh, can decrease the seizure duration. ECT effectiveness will be decreased if you used it. A gap in knowledge on the in-training exam for 2018, meaning that more than 50% of the people who took the exam at the CA3 level missed this question, was that Dinepazil, or Aricept, a drug used for Alzheimer's dementia, can prolong the duration of action of succinylcholine. Dinepazil, or Aricept, is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So think of it like neostigmine, but in the brain. It's centrally acting and crosses the blood-brain barrier. And it is a reversible inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase, as opposed to echothiophate, which is used in glaucoma patients as eye drops. And those eye drops in those glaucoma patients irreversibly inhibit acetylcholinesterase, and pseudocholinesterase for that matter. Um, so a patient taking denepazil or Aricept for their Alzheimer's dementia has inhibition of the acetylcholinesterase and pseudocholinesterase because acetylcholinesterase and pseudocholinesterase have similar structures in many ways. So there can be an interaction with our neuromuscular blocking agents. So an Alzheimer's dementia patient who's on denepazil, think if I give them succinylcholine, and pseudocholinesterase is inhibited, pseudocholinesterase breaks down pseudo, uh, succinylcholine, therefore I could have possible prolongation of the effect of succinylcholine. Usually this is less than an hour. Now non-depolarizers like rocuronium and vecuronium, if you have uh, inhibition of acetylcholinesterase at the postjunctional membrane, you will have more acetylcholine at that postjunctional mem membrane competing with rocuronium, and so it will require more rocuronium 
to maintain neuromuscular blockade. So the manufacturer actually recommends withholding Aricept for at least two weeks prior to scheduled operations, although I suspect most would not cancel a surgery in someone who took Dinepazil the day before or even the morning of an operation, but just realize that neuromuscular blockade can be um, an interaction with this drug. The next is a key word is lithium anesthetic interactions. Lithium is usually uh, taken by patients with bipolar disorder. Preoperatively, you should think of the thyroid potentially being affected. Hypothyroidism can occur because there's decreased production of T4 and decreased deionization of T4 to T3. Diabetes insipidus is associated with lithium because of uh, interactions with cyclic AMP in the kidney. And there can be cardiac changes such as T-wave flattening or inversion on our electrocardiogram. The main point here though is that lithium can interact with and potentiate both non-depolarizing and depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. Um, it can decrease the MAC of our volatile anesthetics. The next group of keywords we're going to talk about is orthopedics and in 2018 in green are shown the orthopedic keywords tourniquet deflation, tourniquet management, tourniquet pain, blindness postoperatively, and the um, methyl methacrylate glue that's used in orthopedic surgery. So let's focus on tourniquet management first. A thigh tourniquet is usually blown up to about 100 millimeters of mercury above the baseline systolic blood pressure and an arm tourniquet about 50 millimeters above baseline systolic blood pressure. We try not to keep that tourniquet up more than two hours because after that it's associated with neurologic and muscle injury. There's some absolute contraindications to inflating a tourniquet on a limb. One would be sickle cell disease. You can imagine if you blew up a cuff on a uh, leg, the blood in that leg would uh, be exposed to low oxygen levels and cells sickle in a patient with sickle cell disease in response to hypoxia. So a sickle cell crisis could be uh, uh, made to happen in a patient uh, if a tourniquet is blown up on an extremity. If they have severe peripheral vascular disease, you're not getting much blood to that extremity already, you blow up a cuff on it, they uh, could potentially lose a limb. Uh, someone who has ongoing ischemia of, a, of an operative limb, if they have severe peripheral neuropathy in that limb, a dialysis graft, you wouldn't want to cut off blood flow to that dialysis graft. Now tourniquet pain and prevention was a key word. Tourniquet pain, when that cuff goes up, after a very short period of time, there's this dull, burning, deep, poorly localized pain that tends to be carried in C fibers. Remember A delta and C fibers are the main carriers of pain. A delta, very fast response, C fibers, uh, non-myelinated, slow response. And in a patient with a tourniquet on and having this pain, they can often have an associated increase in blood pressure. And this occurs very commonly, up to two-thirds during limb surgery under regional anesthesia and occurring about 30 to 60 minutes after inflation. What do you do? Well, one, you can deepen the anesthesia. Give supplemental intravenous agents like ketamine, um, uh, dexmedetomidine, opioids. If you're using a double cuff, uh, the uh, more distal cuff can be deflated after the more proximal cuff is inflated. So it's like taking down one cuff uh, and giving some relief to the tissue that's underneath it. Another thing that you can do if it's in the upper extremity, um, use an intercostal brachial and a musculocutaneous nerve block. The intercostal brachial nerve block is done with a ring of local anesthetic uh, in the upper arm. Um, and the musculocutaneous nerve can be blocked in the coracobrachialis muscle, which is below the biceps muscle. The uh, prevention also can be to just simply deflate the tourniquet, because that's the definitive treatment for tourniquet pain. Tourniquet inflation and deflation pathophysiology. What happens uh, when you inflate and deflate the cuff? First, inflation, as the cuff goes up, um, systemic vascular resistance goes up, blood pressure goes up. CVP goes up, uh, the temperature in that non-perfused limb is start, gonna start to go down. So you have a sink of cold blood sitting there. 
and anaerobic metabolism occurring with building up of lactate and potassium in that limb such that when you deflate the cough after one to two hours, um, there's a sudden decrease in volume as the extremity is opened back up and a drop in systemic vascular resistance such that your blood pressure goes down and your CVP goes down. And that cold blood that's in that extremity mixes uh, with the blood in your core body and there's a decrease in temperature. And the CO2 that built up in that uh, extremity um, and the acid comes back into the body and there's a transient rise in end tidal CO2. It's not uncommon. You're merrily going along at an end tidal CO2 of 35 and it jumps up into the 50, 55 range. And it, you can imagine if someone had problems with intracranial pressure such as a let's say a traumatized person who has TBI, traumatic brain injury with some ICP issues and fractures, and their ICP was hanging around 15 to 20, and you had a rise in end tidal CO2, cerebral blood flow would go up with that rise in end tidal CO2, and cerebral blood volume could go up, and ICP could go up also. Also with deflation, potassium comes back from that limb, and you can have dysrhythmias, even cardiac arrest. So lowering of the pH, lowering of the bicarbonate level, increasing of the potassium, increasing of the lactate, decreasing body temperature, drop in blood pressure, drop in CVP, all associated with that 2018 keyword deflation of a tourniquet. The next is methyl methacrylate or bone cement. The picture at the top right shows a reaming of a femur. When you put bone cement and have high intramedullary pressures as it's being reamed, you can have embolization of that bone cement or even embolization of fat, air, or bone marrow itself. So a sudden drop in end tidal CO2 during reaming, think of some form of embolization. And methyl methacrylate, that bone cement, was the key word. What does it do? Well, as it's mixed, there's an exothermic reaction that occurs. So it gets really hot. That's number one. Number two, it is associated as it's being placed and reamed in with hypotension and circulatory collapse and a small percentage of the total hip replacements. Not sure of the etiology, but absorption of the volatile monomer of the methyl methacrylate has been associated with vasodilation. Embolization could be the cause. Lysis of red blood cells from the exothermic or very hot uh, reaction that occurs. So when you're getting ready to do this reaming and bone cementing, Adequate hydration is important and maximizing the inspired oxygen concentration to minimize hypotension and hypoxemia that can accompany the cementing of the prosthesis. And if you were using nitrous oxide to shut it off uh, uh, before the cementing uh, and have a higher FiO2 because there's a risk of air emboli and there's a risk of having this circulatory collapse, you would want high FiO2 and not have nitrous present that could expand an air bubble if air emboli occurred. Next group of keywords is fluids and anesthesia 2018. They're listed here. In green are the ones from 2018. Serum osmolality components, crystalloid versus colloid side effects, normal saline administration and the laboratory findings associated with large volume normal saline administration, volume status monitoring, and burns fluid management. First of all, body water and osmolality components. Body water, the normal adult, is about 60 to 70 percent water. That means that if you're 60 percent water and you're 70 kilograms, that's about 42 liters of water. Our percent body water decreases the more fat we have, and we have more fat as we age, and females also have more fat. Body water in general is distributed mostly intracellular, two-thirds, one-third extracellular, and the osmolality of our body is mainly determined by how much sodium we have. And we can estimate our normal osmolality, which is about 285 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram, by two times the sodium plus glucose over 18 plus BUN over 2.8. So you can see that if your sodium is about 140, that is by far the major component of our normal body osmolality. Even if the glucose was uh, 1,000, um, it would have an effect, but not nearly as much effect as sodium. So you have to have really big elevations in glucose and BUN uh, 
for them to affect osmolality. If we look at our IV fluids, D5 is hypoosmolar, 0.9 is hyperosmolar, LR is isoosmolar, and hypertonic or 3% saline is very hyperosmolar. And the picture at the bottom right shows percent body water at uh, birth, about 80%, normal adult 70%, and an elderly person 50 to 60% body water. Again, the key word was osmolality components, and the main take home message is that sodium is the major component. Crystalloids versus colloids and the side effects. If we have a healthy glycocalyx, that little lining of, uh, of our vascular endothelium, the colloids stay intravascularly while crystalloids go through and into the interstitial space. Intervascular expansion uh, or hemodilution occurs um, as we give a bunch of fluids. If we pour in a bunch of crystalloid, we have hemodilution that occurs. If we pour in colloids, it stays intervascularly and draws fluids in and hemodilution occurs. Colloids such as 5% albumin, approximately for every cc that we give, one cc stays intervascularly, so 100 mils of 5% albumin would give you approximately 100 mils of intervascular volume expansion, as opposed to crystalloids like lactated ringers and saline, although there's controversy about this, approximately 3 to 1, or um, we have to give three times as much um, crystalloid um, as we want to stay uh, intervascular. So 100 mils of lactated ringers, about a third of that would stay intervascular, or about 30 mils. So if you gave 100 cc's of albumin and 100 cc's of saline, the albumin would more hemodilute uh, the hematocrit than would 100 cc's of crystalloid. More bang for the buck, intervascular volume expansion. Albumin's important for oncotic pressure. Sodium's important for osmotic pressure. Both crystalloids and colloids, when given in large amounts, can dilute the platelets and dilute the coagulation factors like factor VIII. And you can get into problems with dilutional coagulopathy with large volume resuscitation with both crystalloids and colloids. There is little difference in the efficacy of crystalloids or colloids as your choice of volume expander. But you can imagine, if you resuscitate to equal intravascular volume, uh, uh, with crystalloids or colloids, you're going to have to give a lot more crystalloid and you end up with the Michelin man uh, afterwards with large amount of peripheral edema, more peripheral edema with crystalloids than colloids. Head of starch can uh, cause problems with coagulation and the kidneys, although there's some de debate about this. Uh, dilutional coagulopathy with uh, head of starch, reducing factor eight. Um, when it's given in large volumes, it's recommended if you use it not to exceed 20 mils per kilogram or approximately three bags of it for a 70 kilogram person in a 24 hour period. And there's question about it being associated with renal injury in critically ill patients who have renal insufficiency. Let's look at fluid types and components uh, before we talk about saline in the laboratory findings, which was the key word. Normal saline has 154 milliequivalents of chloride in it, as well as 154 milliequivalents of sodium. This is a lot of chloride, so hyperchloremic, and the osmolarity is slightly hyperosmolar at 308. Ringer's lactate has a lactate in it as the anion. The lactate is metabolized to bicarbonate, as is citrate and acetate, if you have a normally functioning liver and the osmolarity of Ringer's lactate is 274. Then we'll skip over to D5W, which the osmolarity is hypo, hypoosmolar, low osmolarity, and when dextrose is metabolized, it leaves water behind and it goes to all the water spaces of the body. Albumin is mixed in with some sodium and chloride, uh, and it's usually supplied as a 5% solution, and it is hyperosmolar. Now let's go to our key word, which is saline laboratory findings. If you give 0.9 normal saline, large volume, 5, 10 liters of normal saline, there's a lot of chloride being given because normal saline has chloride 154 milliequivalents per liter. Our body doesn't have 154 milliequivalents of liter uh, per liter in our plasma. So hyperchloremia ensues. Lots of anions around chloride. The strong ion difference, which is a 
difference between the positive charged cations and the negatively charged anions. If you have more anions now, it reduces the strong ion difference. And you have to keep electrical neutrality in the body. So if you gained a bunch of negative charged anions, water has to dissociate to hydrogen ion to keep electrical neutrality. So acidosis ensues. So large volume normal saline results in a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Large volume lactated ringers, the lactate is metabolized to bicarbonate, you can get a metabolic alkalosis. And lactated ringers also has calcium in it, which can precipitate citrated blood if it happened to be infused through the same line. D5W, we said, was hypoosmolar and can actually increase brain water in a traumatic brain injured patient. That would be one uh, reason for not giving D5W. But another reason is increased glucose in the presence of an ischemic brain worsens ischemic brain injury, and we tend to avoid uh, sugar containing uh, IV solutions in patients with brain injury. And then lastly, a rare disease, periodic paralysis. The hypokalemic form, if you give glucose to a person with hypokalemic periodic paralysis, as their glucose goes up in their blood, their insulin kicks in and to drive the glucose into the cell. Well, insulin also drives potassium into the cell. And if you drive potassium in the cell, you can get hypokalemia. And hypokalemia is the stimulus for the periodic paralysis or loss in skeletal muscle a strength. And so giving sugar to someone with hypokalemic periodic paralysis can induce that paralysis. Our last couple uh, slides here or keywords. The first here is assessing volume status. And we can do that with urine output and blood pressure and cardiac output, the size of the left ventricle with echo, wedge pressure, CVP, and heart rate. But one of the things we use now is fluid responsiveness, which is a dynamic rather than a static parameter, trying to predict what's going to happen if we give fluid to a patient. One thing that you can do is simply lift the legs of a patient, which is like giving them some volume, and look what happens to their stroke volume if you're measuring that, or look what happens to their blood pressure. And if it goes up, you can say, aha, if I give fluids, their stroke volume or blood pressure is going to go up probably can give fluids. If it went down, you'd say, ooh, I might be at the end of my Frank Starling curve. I better not do that. Let the legs back down. No harm, no foul. Now, we use heart-lung interactions during mechanical ventilations to measure things like pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation to try to predict what's going to happen if we give fluids to a patient. So if you have someone being mechanically ventilated at at least 8 mils per kilogram tidal volume, and neuromuscular blockade is present, so they can't be breathing spontaneously, then we can measure stroke volume variation and look at pulse pressure variation, like in the graphic at the top right. And you can see at initially, as inspiration kicks in, the lungs squeeze the blood vessels in the chest, and more blood actually goes to the left side of the heart. And stroke volume initially goes up, as does um, the pressure. So Stroke volume and pressure go up, but you all know that if you hold an inspiration and raise interthoracic pressure, eventually the blood pressure and stroke volume goes down. If you hold really high peak airway pressures, interthoracic pressures, keep the bag uh, full and squeezing and giving uh, large high pressure breaths to a patient and watch your A-line, the blood pressure goes down, you can actually cause a cardiac arrest if you hold um, uh, high pressure ventilation for a long period of time. So the initial effect, increase in uh, uh, the stroke volume, increase in the pressure, but then look at what happens uh, to the pressure. It goes down at the end of inspiration. And if there's big differences between inspiration and expiration of the stroke volume or the pulse pressure, we say, aha, that stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation, they need fluids. Another important point is the Bainbridge reflex, which is an atrial reflex. If the atria is stretched, it's overfilled, the heart says, I need to make the left atrium and the right atrium smaller, so the heart rate picks up and uh, in an attempt to reduce the size of that atrium. And conversely, if the atrium happened to be underfilled and small, the heart rate goes down, bradycardia, in an attempt to give more time for the atria to fill adequately. The last slide keyword is burns and fluid management. And the Parkland formula should come to mind when you think about fluid management 
for a burnt patient. If we have second and third degree burns, we use lactated ringers, crystalloid rather than colloids. Colloids can leak out and increase edema. And the magic formula is four mils of crystalloid per kilo per percent burn during the first 24 hours. And you give half of that calculated volume in the first eight hours and the second half of that during the next 16 hours. The rule of nines can be used to estimate how much a surface area of the body is burned. A patient's hand can be used to approximate 1% of the body surface area. An extremity upper is 9%, extremity lower is 18%. So this rule of nines um, uh, can be used to estimate the percent burned. The modified Brook formula is another formula to estimate how much crystalloids to give. However, the Parkland formula is the most commonly used. And this ends our 2018 multi-topic keyword review. Um, I hope you have a great day. These are pictures from Kentucky and a winter ride I recently took on my bike in Kentucky. I hope you have a great day.